You know, I, and people don't see this stuff, right? They're crying in the backseat of my car. They're crying on the way to jail. Um, and, and it's one of those things where it's like, I disappointed my family, I disappointed my mom, you know, or I'm, I'm at the jail talking to them. You know, they're, they're getting ready to go to prison, right? Being transferred off to prison. You're having conversations with them. And they're like, man, I, I don't know why I made these decisions and things like that. And it's, you know, how do we get here? Black boy, tell me how you really feel. I just want to build with you. A Dunwoody police officer is out of the hospital tonight, just 36 hours after he was dragged by a car along Interstate 285. Newly released dash cam video shows just how close a call it was for Officer Nathan Daly. And we want to warn you that this is pretty hard to watch here, folks. You can see Officer Daly and a fellow officer talking to the driver. They pulled the person over Ashford Dunwoody Road. That's right at Interstate 285. It happened yesterday when the car starts to pull away. The officer, Officer Daly, grabs on. Soon he's hanging on for dear life. Half in the window, half outside that window as the car speeds down the interstate. The driver guns it onto other cars. The ramp then suddenly swerves, as you can see right there, nearly hitting a van. Officer Daly is hurled into traffic and the suspect is caught soon after. Now, Dunwoody police say that they originally stopped Derek Simpson for for texting and driving. Now he's facing a handful of charges and tonight for the very first time folks we're getting a getting to see and hear from Officer Daly. Now it's going to take some time for him to recover, but there is nothing nothing wrong with his funny bone. Sweeps. Not a man here who could sense me. I'm on the pier Elohim with the energy. Uh, black boy, tell me how you really feel. I just want to build with you. We're too scatterbrained of a community yeah. and those who are successful. And the, the reality is the people who have it together have to come together and build and then and then let other people benefit off of what we build in order to bring the community together. That's the only way to do it. We can't pull up people who don't want to be pulled up. So to be like me, you and a collective yeah. who have our who understand the problem, we just need to get together and put it together and then allow the, the blessings of what we're doing impact those around us and allow it to, you get what I'm saying? That's the only way to do it um, because you can't convince a person who's unconvincible. Yeah. Um, but you're right. When he said that, why does this even, why do you even care? You're not even ADOS. Right, right. It's bigger right. than this, man. Yeah, it's, it's bigger, bigger than this. The fact that you even, the fact that even came out your mouth. In, in, in their defense, because um, I had to learn this too the hard way, a lot of Africans and, you know, I think it's kind of similar to the fact that when you meet a black woman, you're guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because the yeah. branding around black men is yeah, such. Yeah, yeah. So you have to come in understanding that. True. You know, and with Africans, too many of us, I don't know if it's the same for Jamaicans. I doubt it's the same, but too many of us are condescending. And yeah. too many of us don't understand the historical context and don't put it in proper context. When this is true. About it. There's so much because the Africans have so much pride, you know, it's pride and it's understandable. But, you know, I had a friend of mine, he's Nigerian. And he explained it to me. He said, um, we're talking about how the whole thing went down with slavery and all that. I said, I said, ain't Nigeria over there on the West Side? You know, I said, ain't y'all, you know, y'all got a little part of that. I said, that wealth is generational. The nation, Nigeria is a wealthy nation. You know, that stuff didn't happen overnight. But the continent within itself is just a, it's a living, breathing wealth of just resources, minerals, you know? So everything over there is beautiful, but um, we had the conversation and he said, well, there, he said, there's a misconception. We, you know, we weren't selling our people because our people is our tribe, right? We didn't look at each other just because our skin's the same. I said, fuck, that's right, dope. Right, right. Like, and, you know, and, and a lot of it too, and, and this is what I tell African-Americans, a lot of it too, it wasn't literally, I'm gonna sell you, right? It, a lot of it was coercion. A lot of it was the white man comes into my village and it's like, if you don't sell this guy, we're going to we'll take yours. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's like, ah. But the thing that bothers me, which is why I question history a little bit, because the balls of white people, though, right? The way they're able to go from place to place to place and conquer, you know? And, I, and one of the things that I notice is that their heart is so deceptive in nature. Even today, you see them biologically, they're still the same. Right. Mentally, like you can you can have I have white friends, but when I talk to them about certain issues, they have there's a sense of malice. Mm. Right. There's a sense of lack of empathy that they have. And it's just so organic. Right. It's innate. I have I have a theory. This, uh, this is my theory. Right. Yeah. I don't have any, you know, yeah. it's all, all, all feelings. We all, we all, 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 right. 
I'm saying? My theory is this. So when you look at where white people originate from, the Caucasus Mountains, right? right? The, the cold areas. Cold. If you do not move, you die. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and one of the things, you know, I've learned is necessity breeds innovation. Mm-hmm. If, if you have to move, you will. You know what right. I'm saying? Some of the best work any of us will ever do is when our back is up against the wall. Correct. White people's back was born up against the wall. Yeah, now, in contrast, mentality. exactly. In contrast, you go to Africa, water's right here. All mm-hmm. these minerals are right here. Mm-hmm. Food is right here, right here. So we become docile, lazy, and complacent. We can share. White people, yeah. if they weren't developing tactics to preserve the scarce resources, yeah. to exploit other people's resources, to For defend survival. against other people exploiting theirs. Yeah. You know, you look at the Vikings, you look yes. at the, the, you know what I'm saying? If they didn't do that, they would have literally died. So you fast forward. Yeah. There's still that sense of yeah. manifest destiny. It's yes. still in that same spirit. Darwinism. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And so on, on, a, on a psychological level, I almost empathize with them. Mm-hmm. But I agree. it's going to flip, unfortunately, because that's where Africa is now. Africa is the, the doggy dog. Like, and I tell people, and most Nigerians won't talk about this. The reason why a lot of Nigerians don't visit as often as we could Mm -hmm. is because not only are we afraid of maybe getting kidnapped by some poor, you know, poor kids, some juveniles, we're scared that our own brother, our own cousin might kill us. Really? When I went to Nigeria, like, because it... (laughs) Where's the money? What's the money? What's what's the what's the 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 money is it the organs? It's everything. Um, the so so it, it, it's it's money, mm-hmm. but it's also jealousy. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's also you came for where I came from. Why did God God pick you? Mm. You see what I'm saying? So like one of my homeboys, he just went home uh, recently um, to get married. He died. He was killed, and they suspect that it's somebody he's related to. I remember when we went back to Nigeria the last time, when we visited the village. Um, you know, we stayed for about a week and then we were, um, we were about to leave and go back to the city. We left at 3 a.m. Damn. We didn't tell nobody. No, tell nobody. We didn't tell nobody. So, so is it difficult for them to get visas to come to the state? Yeah. 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 The only reason I'm here is because we won a lottery. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, and I think the difference with how I look at things and how a lot of Nigerians look at things is most of the Nigerians you meet come from wealthy families. They right. come from the yeah. families where daddy paid for, we had to borrow money to get here, man. Right, right. We had to live with my, my aunt and my uncle in New York when we got here. Like, so that is the real Nigeria. 99.9% of us are like me. Okay. But the ones most of you know, Americans meet are the 1%. They're the Prince Akeem. Flashy, yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Interesting. It's bad. The, the problem is though, no one wants to have conversation. Mm-hmm. No one wants to dialogue. You know, I have Nigerian friends um, and it's funny, it's funny you say that they, uh, <laughs> there's a sense of, um, the majority of Nigerians I've met are very, um, very confident, right? It's pseudo confidence. This is true. Um, and, and it's, it's interesting because you never know people's story, but then when you when you go behind the scenes and you pull the veil back again, you see the truth. You know, I think what ends up happening is then you have Black Americans who see they come in contact with with uh, people from Nigeria, and there's this assumption that that Black Americans think that Nigerians one people think everybody from Africa is the same, right? And they think that there's this arrogance there, and so there's this natural clash because no one takes the time to talk. So you see someone that's Nigerian and they're very, they're very, a lot, all I, I've never seen a Nigerian that wasn't well put together, right? Clean, <laughs> clean outfits, the parties. There's a sense of jealousy there because you have, you have someone coming from a country that, um, that, that, that you were taken from, in a sense, one of the many countries you were taken from, and they have such rich culture. When I see Nigerians, I, I love you guys because you remind me of my family, right? The dancing. You know, the pride, the pride in the, uh, the culture, the pride where you come from. A lot of, a lot of, you can't tell the difference. When I'm with Nigerians, you know, I fit right in. I'm in there doing my little, you know, trying to do my little, you know, my little, my little hands, you know. So what's funny is uh, I, 
I have an issue with uh, black Americans too sometimes because there's a sense of wanting to belong to something, you know, and wanting to, to connect with something bigger than themselves. And I remember talking to someone and they're like, oh, you know, we're kings and queens. And I'm like, listen, it's not how it works. Not how it works. And not only that, you know, Egypt is way on the other side, you guys. Everybody wasn't a pharaoh. Like, you know, I have to kind of bring this reality and it, it, it kind of breaks people's, uh, their, their, their false sense of importance. Like, oh, hey, all you guys weren't descendants of Cleopatra. You know what I mean? And, and just, it just is what it is. Like, but, but I understand, you know, the problem is it's something I always say on my channel that as, as black Americans, we have to redefine what it means to be black. Like we have to, you have to develop your own culture. That's what Marcus Garvey was trying to get black Americans to do. You got to create your own nation within a nation because with that, there's an identity. So the, the identity crisis that a lot of black Americans are suffering from is where we're having all the problems over here. And people get upset with me or they get upset with someone like you because we're on the outside looking in, but we understand and we see it because we're like, hey, you guys wake up, you know? I, I will say this though, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a minority, right? right. And, and the reason I say that is I'm more critical of African culture than Nigerian, I mean, than American culture. Okay. And this is why. I think it is very well documented what slavery did to African Americans. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's as well documented what colonialism did to Africans. Okay. And I think part of the reason why, relative to Africans, African Americans have made so much more progress than us mm -hmm. in their plight is because our plight was a lot more covert. Right. So what I mean, for example, is a lot of people don't know this, but Marcus Garvey's Pan-African flag mm -hmm. was the inspiration for the Biafran flag in Nigeria. Okay. A lot of what um, Nelson Mandela used to liberate his people was inspired by American civil rights activists. Okay. Right, so there's that link but the reason why it's more insidious what happens in Africa is like, um, for instance, what happened in the Congo, mm -hmm. the, 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 the pact for the continuation of colonization. Mm -hmm. You can stay on your land, but you have to use French francs, whereas France, they use the euro. Right. You have to deposit, I think it's like 90% of your bank reserves in it's France. In France. Yep. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, I'm a proud Congolese person, but are you? Right. You know what I'm saying? Are you still France, bitch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think there's an audacity that African-Americans have that we have to respect, especially as Africans. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think the reason why we don't is because we don't, know, number one, most Africans don't fully know their history. Mm. As much as we say, oh, we're rich in culture, we're rich in the pageantry of culture. Okay. And, and, and then number two, they don't know American history and they're not honest enough about what colonialism did. I agree. And until we come to that table, because my job is humbling Africans. I don't humble African Americans. Yeah, yeah. My job is humbling Africans because we're the most bullshitting motherfuckers <laughs> on the planet. And maybe I'm saying that because I'm jaded because I'm African, but like we're the most bu Listen, man, it's all about, and, and that's why in Africa right now, part of the insecurity and part of what motherfuckers really won't tell you is, if you go to Africa, if you go to, I'm just gonna speak of Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. If you go to Nigeria and you get robbed, right? Nine times out of 10, the, the part that's the most fucked up for me is the person who robbed you is a university graduate. Mm. Probably graduated top of his class. Right. But it's so fucked up, there are no opportunities for him. So he turns to crime. Here in America, the person who robs you is a criminal. He dropped out of high school. Correct. That is, a, he's an engineering student, an right. engineering phenom, but he couldn't do any, but he still has to provide for his family. Right. And that's what it is. So in Africa, the dollar is God. Mm -hmm. Your parents don't give a fuck what you do, how you're changing the world, this and that. They care about, did you buy him a, uh, your mom a Mercedes? Right. When you pull up, when you pull up to the village, when you pull up to the, to, to mm. the, to the hood, is everybody looking at you like, oh, this is so, so, so son. Yeah. There are more Nigerian doctors in New York than in the entire country. Yeah. 
you, you know, you know what's going on. And I, I spoke about this before. One of the biggest problems, you know, where India was having this issue, Africa's having an issue where a lot of the best and brightest are leaving the country, coming to the U.S. and getting educated or, yes. or and they're not going back to, to build up their country. And I had a conversation with someone. I was like, well, why would we go back? You know, and I said, well, this is the problem. You know, exactly. this is the problem. And, you know, the power of the dollar, man. That's it. You know, in, um, in Buddhism, they have a saying, uh, one of the precepts is the, uh, they talk about human suffering. And human suffering is caused by the, by, by the love and the, uh, the fixations of, of attachments. You're attached to things. This is what causes human suffering. And if you're unable to detach yourself from these things, then you suffer because of it. And criminal justice, we have a theory. It's called strain theory, like you Criminals, or I won't say criminals, individuals, they get put in a position where they can't obtain things legitimately, right? That they see other people obtain. And because of that, there's like this internal strife. And that internal strife will push them to want to do things illegitimately in order to obtain something that someone else got legitimately. It's called a strain theory. And I, I always love that theory because it doesn't explain all crime, but it explains the one where the everyday regular person feels so caught up in what, they, what else is going on, things that don't matter, things that are irrelevant in life, but we put relevance to it, right? Like you said, again, we start fixating on this flashy lifestyle, but then when someone else can't do what you are doing, regardless of whether or not it's real or not, right, or fictitious, I see it and I want to emulate that and I can't. And that, that hurts me internally, I struggle not knowing that it's irrelevant, right? It means nothing, it brings no value to my life. And so now I wanna, I wanna try to duplicate that as much as possible. And I realize I can't, I'm 16, you know? Where I should be focusing on school and growing and educating myself and finding my own path. I end up, well, this is a TLC, don't go chasing waterfalls, right? Stick to the rivers and the lakes, you know? You're, you're, go get the lake, that's what, you're, that's what you're capable of doing. But you want the waterfall. And you're willing to do whatever it takes to get it. And this is what inspires a lot of our youth to kind of get into a life of crime, you know? And, and I love that theory so much because you can apply it to a lot of things in life. It's just an internal strife, but that comes from an attachment, Thanks. you know? Uh, why am I attached to a Mercedes? You know what I mean? Why am I attached to any of those things? What's the, what does it really mean? Uh, are you familiar with Charleston White? <clears throat> You need to look into him. He, he's an interesting character, man. He's like a, he, his nickname is Rat Williams. <laughs> and the reason they call him Rat Williams is he kind of looks like Cat Williams. Oh, okay. But his whole brand is built around, he's, he's pretty much like a real life Uncle Ruckus. But, okay. if, but if, you can, if you can look past what he's saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. man, he'd be spitting. One of the things he said, one of the things he said that really stuck out to me, he said, you know, because he, he, um, he tutors the youth and he gives, you know, talks at um, um, youth detention centers and, and different things like that. And he talked about, you know, before he went to jail, before he went to prison, he said that when he was coming up, he would remember um, whenever a kid came back from college, you know what I'm saying? How that kid was treated. You know, people were like, oh, good job, this and that. But he said he always remembered when the drug dealers came back from, from jail. He said, man, they were celebrated. Yeah. So he said, he, he remember thinking, he remembers thinking to himself at like seven years old. He was like, when I grow up, I want to be a criminal. There you go. Yeah. And it was like, man, that's, that's heavy. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times when we dialogue around crime, we, we focus on black pathology. Mm -hmm. Like this idea that we want to be criminals. We want to do wrong, as opposed to the psychology and everything else that's right. involved into it. So what are your thoughts on that, man? It's not about, it's not about people want to be, that we want to be criminals. You know, obviously, you know, I talk to criminals all the time. Um, what it is, is it's the need to be validated. It just so happens that in our, in our, in our community, the validation comes from people who appear to be thugs or appear to be powerful, the, the important people. Again, it's, it's, it's who the community acknowledges. We want to be who the community acknowledges. If you think about 
back in any type of civilization, back, you know, thousands of years, it, it could be the strongest knight, right? Or the strongest member of the tribe, right? It's, it, it has, it's, it's, it's all culture. It's culture. Culture defines what's important, what's relevant, what's not relevant. This is why I say we have to redefine our culture. We have to reteach, re-indoctrinate new values or different value systems. Currently, and in some aspects of our community, some portions of our community, there's, a, there's an idea that if you are a person of uh, like a, a drug dealer, if you're a gang member, these people are glorified. Right. And so why are they glorified? Because the community has collectively said that we like these groups of people. We like this character. We like how it makes us feel when we see them. We think it's cool. Right. So we uplift them. And because we uplift them, you have young kids who see it and they say, I want to be like that. Right. We uplift our celebrities. We uplift and we idolize. Right. And that's all it is. It's idolization. But we're idolizing negativity. We're idolizing um, uh, criminal behavior, right? Because we are encouraging people to live a life of crime because it looks cool. It's popular and women find it attractive mm -hmm. and men are always going to go in the direction where the women are. And if the women in our community are saying that this is the type of man that we find attractive, that we find sexy, that we want to actually breed with, what do men do? Men always rise to the occasion that, or we rise to the level that women set. So if women, women are always going to be the key of correction. I always say that. If you, if you, it's like when you go to the club and it's like, yo, it's $50 to get in. I'm like, shh. But then you see three baddies walk in. You're like, ah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but if you go into the club and it's $5 to get in, there's no baddies in there, right? Because men are very simple-minded, right? You know, it's like, uh, I always say, it's just like Pavlov's dog, the whole thing with that, right? And, and we're very simple. This is, why we, this is why to fix it, to fix culture, we have to look at what are, women, what are women exalting, right? What is the image that women exalt? If women were exalting strong, educated men, men who aspired to be leaders, aspired to be... Uh, academically educated or just hardworking, responsible. If that was the guy, the nerd, right? The guy that might be a little goofy, but he was passionate, he was determined. You know, he had good morals, good values. He didn't believe in going to jail, right? He, he, he doesn't like criminal, uh, he, he, he doesn't dive into criminal issues or criminal behavior, like that's not, his, that's not his thing. If that was something that women loved and enjoyed and say, this is the guy, this is, these are the guys that we are attracted to. Then the men are going to make the correction because men do what women want, right? We, 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 we acquire certain things because it's part of a mating ritual. You know, every species has it. And so when you think about what is the black mating ritual, right? If you, if you, if you a thug, if you got money, you got jewelry, you got expensive things, this is what the women are saying they want. And so even as a man, you don't want to live that lifestyle in order to get the woman that you want or a certain caliber of women. You're going to do whatever it takes, unfortunately. And that's not all men, as we know, but it's too many. And so the, the correction has to come from the image, right? How, how do we redefine the image of what's important? Um, again, like you said, there is a uh, BLM, um, not B, is it BLM? Black uh, BMF, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the Black Mafia family. So, you know, they had that show. They had the show telling them about the story. When I started policing, the, the organization had just got toppled, right? They had just broke the organi organization down. But they're still picking up members. I remember the, the teams, different SWAT teams were still going out and they were hitting little locations and raiding certain places. And when I learned about them, I've learned about them from the music because I'm a big Jeezy fan. So, you know, I'd always listen to Jeezy, but then working, coming into law enforcement, I start hearing about the organization in Atlanta. I was like, oh, damn, they're still getting these guys? You know, it's like the, the cronies, the little leftover, right? The crumbs. They're still picking these guys up. Well, then fast forward, here we are, 2021, 2022, you know, Big Meech is getting ready to be released. They had this massive party, right? He's not even out yet. And it's going to be massive. It's going to be massive. And it's not, of course, celebrate his release. You know, he did his time. You know what I mean? And so there's, there's, 
there's no shame in that. He did his time. He did, he did what he had to do, whatever. So I respect that as well. But again, the way we exalt wrong behavior, right? You know, what would it look like if Big Meech came out and was like, hey, you guys, don't do what I did. You know, um, yeah, I had the cars. I had the women. I had the money. I made X amount of millions of dollars. Oh, yeah, like Rick cool. Ross? Oh, Rick Ross, right. So you have a real um, Rick Ross, who was a real gangster, who was a real, you know, big time guy. And then you have the rapper, Freeway Rick Ross. And then you have, then you have the rapper, Rick Ross. Uh-huh. You know, he takes on the persona of a real, real big time, you know, drug guy. Right. And so and now he raps about it. He raps about someone else's lifestyle. Now, whether or not Rick Ross does what he does, you know, whatever now is irrelevant. But the idea is there was somebody who was really about that life. Um, and then so, you know, you got Freeway, you got um, Lucky Luciano. These are like real guys. And you have rappers that want to take on their persona, take on those names. And they want to be these people so bad because in our eyes, you know, these people are respected. They're important. You know, our community has to kind of get away from that, idolizing people who aren't really doing anything positive in our communities. You know, um, they talk about killing one another, selling drugs to one another, destroying our communities, you know, taking family members away, kidnapping, all types of violence. And this is something that we find to be important or, or accepting. And it's, it's toxic. It's self-destructive. I think, you know, some pushback might be the drug guys are more visible. The doctors and the lawyers leave. But when I grow up and I'm seeing the person driving the Mercedes, it's the drug guy. He's the one that is there. It's within arms, arms reach. So how do we how do we do that? Like, how do we solve that part? My thing is, where are the fathers at? Right. Where are the fathers that bring um, reality and discipline into a household? Where are the fathers that are saying, no, that's not that's not a healthy lifestyle to emulate. Right. The problem within our communities and, and some of these um, disenfranchised black communities, um, the fathers are missing or the fathers live the lifestyle of a high, a high risk lifestyle themselves. They too are in the street. They too are in prison. And so they, you know, the young men, not to say they don't love their kids because a lot of the fathers I've met in the black community, they love their kids, you know, but they live the lifestyle that wasn't honorable, right? Maybe to them, maybe they believe that that's all they have. That's all they could kind of like feed off or live off of. But the reality is, they did their home a disservice, right? They did the, their, their children a disservice by living a counterproductive lifestyle. And I get it. People would say that, well, the reality is this is all we had. We didn't have nothing else. Well, the problem is I worked a middle class and, and I would say lower middle class community. But for the most part, the black community was a middle class, lower middle class. I wasn't dealing with people who were dirt poor. I wasn't working in the hood. You know, some of these parents had good jobs. Um, but their homes were, were probably broken. The fathers were, weren't present and things like that. I've, I've dealt with kids who, who had both parents who were extremely educated, they had good jobs, and the kids still ran the streets. They still wanted to be gang members. They still wanted to be drug dealers. And they were educated, they were smart, there was no excuse. So again, it comes from this, I want to be popular in our community. What does popular look like? What do people, what do people, what do we, what do we exalt in our community? You know, you look at all the shows and the movies that, that are so popular within our community. Everybody wants to be a drug dealer. You would talk about shows like uh, Snowfall. Like, it's a good show, right? But why are all of our best actors, you know, our strong actors, why are we putting them in all these, these roles and these movies and these shows? So my question is always, you know, when I look at these things, I always wonder about why, why do we, we glorify these, these roles, like in movies and entertainment? Again, what do we see in our community? This is something that sells. This sells. This is something that we enjoy watching. It's popular. We feed into it. We give life to it. Um, And what ends up happening is a lot of the younger generations come up as they start watching this. They want to emulate it so bad because they see how how respected it is. And so when you have young men who want to be respected, they see who are the most respectable people in our community. It's those who live this life of crime because of what it affords them. So a lot of times, no, they don't want to be criminals, but they're willing to do what it needs, what they need to do in order to get the reaction that they want from the, the community and their peers. Um, and that's what's dangerous about it, because a lot of those guys, you know, you talk to them, you know, I, and people don't see this stuff. Right. They're crying in the backseat of my car. They're crying on the way to jail. 
Um, and, and it's one of those things where it's like, I disappointed my family, I disappointed my mom, you know, or I'm, I'm at the jail talking to them. You know, they're, they're getting ready to go to prison, right? Being transferred off to prison. And you're having conversations with them. And they're like, man, I, I don't know why I made these decisions and things like that. And it's, you know, how do we get here? Um, and so, no, they don't want to live that lifestyle because it was never forced on them. They're emulating something because they feel like that's what's going to get them the popularity, the attention. Um, and you'll be surprised, man, because listen, they're not spending this money. The crime money is not spent on investing. It's not spent on going to college. It's spent on shoes, clothes. They're tricking the money off at the strip club. You know, it's, it's never anything that's about self-development. Has nothing to do with that. You know, because I saw, I'd be like, by all means, take, take my car, sir. I think you're going to invest it well or whatever. No, it's, I'm doing this because I, I want to feel like I'm somebody important. You know, I want to buy things that I can't afford if I were to get a regular job. I want to I spend my money on things that, you know, that are irrelevant. You know, everything is about instant gratification. It's not about hard work. It's not about... Um, any type of financial discipline. It's about, I want what I want now. I want the Gucci bag. You know, we hear, what are the rappers and the female rappers saying? Like, you can't get with me if you can't buy me a Birkin bag, right? So what do the men do? Oh, I need a chick like this. If I can't afford, yeah. And so, so again, this is the problem. It's, it's toxic. You know, it's toxic. And it puts men in a position, young men, who feel like if they got to, to, to earn these women, our own women, we got to be able to take them on trips to Hawaii, the Maldives, right? They see it on social media and the women do the same thing. The women are like, okay, I want to go on these trips. And what do they do? They end up escorting themselves out. You know, um, a lot of our young women in college are escorting, you know, they're, they're, they're like high profile escorts or they're putting themselves in positions that are, are compromising to themselves and they don't realize it all for for money all for because they want to take a picture I, the last one of the last cases i worked with a young lady she was doing fraud and she was willing you know just so she can go to thailand and take pictures with elephants you know she was willing to get with the guy do whatever for that guy just so he can fly her out you know and this she's 18 years old you know and this is so what happens in that moment you have then all the other young girls are looking at her and they want to be just like her. They want to go on trips overseas. They want to go all over the country taking photos, not knowing what that girl had to do to get there. And, um, and again, that's the dangers of people wanting to emulate the toxic. So, so let, let, let's talk about this because mm-hmm. I like to get to the core of things, right? Absolutely. And for me, you know, when we're talking about crime, particularly in our, in our community, I think what we leave out of the conversation a lot is the fact that America was founded by criminals. Yeah. And because of that, it's always, always celebrated the outlaw Mm -hmm. from the mafia. You know what I'm saying? To the, to the rebels, to the, to the, to the civil war revolutionaries, the whole nine. And the whole Bonnie and Clyde image has also been celebrated by, by cinema. And like we were saying before, a lot of, Black people's idea of reality has been created by fantasy, yes. right? So when you combine that with the fact that a lot of these young boys don't feel like there's an outlook for a long life, they, mm-hmm. they, they, they feel, whether consciously or unconsciously, I'm going I'm to get to 25 tops. Somebody's going to kill me, I'm going to go to jail, right. right? So you combine that and the pathology behind that, combine that with generational trauma, combine that with this country always celebrating the outlaw, not the black outlaw, but always celebrating the outlaw. And you also combine that with, I believe our people have a very deep, I don't know if it's inherent, but an internalized low self-esteem. And a lot of the things we're talking about you know, the trips to Thailand, the, mm-hmm. the, the, cause, cause I'm sure it wasn't even because she wanted to ride an elephant. She wanted other people to be jealous that she's riding. You know what I'm saying? So like, how do we, how do we navigate the core and all those different pieces of what leads the person, the young black boy, for instance, to, 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 to go into crime? We, we have to, you know, honestly, you know, because I just dealing with so many people, we have to, we got to go back to culture. Culture is the root. Culture is always going to be the root because currently right now, this is our culture, 
right? And black and as black Americans, this becomes our culture, meaning that our celebrities are idols, right? These are who we look up to, right? The ones who are uh, in leadership positions, the ones who are doing really great things, uh, right? You you got Megan and um, Cardi B, they're like women of the year for creating a song called WAP. Right. When we have we have black women who are doing phenomenal things, corporate America, creating businesses that are actually helping our community, doing great things with with young women, young black women. So those women are, are not being honored. They're not being um, magnified in our community because we don't see them as being important. It's not going to sell. Right. So we have to there has to be a mind shift and we all have to be willing to accept it. And we have to just stop glorifying ignorant behavior. And that's the key. So what does it look like? There has to be a collective movement to and an understanding say, hey, you guys, there's a difference between we're not dis, we're not saying entertainers aren't important. We're saying that we have to remove them off of pedestals and we need to we need to start correcting what it means to be. What's the positive image? We have to regain control over the black image. Right. What what does a black I mean, look what happened to Kevin Samuels. He puts on a suit. People, people lost it, right? They're not used to looking at a black man in, in a suit, you know, talking the way that he talks with, with authority, right? Very assertive. Again, people are confused. You have young black men who, who, who say, ah, putting on a suit, putting on dress suit makes me uncomfortable, right? So we have to now, we have to start re-educating our people to, to start looking at the real, real healthy image as being something to aspire to and the things that are unhealthy Right. It's a mind shift. Right. We have it backwards. And so what we need to do is one, it starts with education. The problem is uh, we don't have a we don't have an avenue, uh, a strong avenue to educate our own people. Right. Um, we start we start having a tool like YouTube now. And a lot of us abuse our platform. Right. A lot of us, we, we people are watching less TV. And now, you know, you have a YouTube platform. It becomes large. And you care more about the money, you care more about the entertainment, right? It becomes a another real, like real housewives, another bad girls club, another, uh, you know, reality show in a sense where people black, you know, black men and women are just going at each other and it has no productive value. 